Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to differentiate between dry and wet gangrene. So to preface this topic, neither kind of gangrene is good. You don't want either one of them. But dry gangrene is really the lesser of two evils. Okay, it's not as bad as wet gangrene. However, dry gangrene can progress into wet gangrene, and the way I think about this is the W in wet is for the W in worst prognosis. Now, generally speaking, gangrene occurs as a result of dead tissue, which occurs usually because there's a lack of blood flow to that part of the body. So we'll first start by looking at this dry gangrene, but in this case, most likely what's happened here is there's a lack of blood flow, and I mean a severe lack of blood flow, to the second digit of the foot, a little bit on the third digit right here immediately. And so with lack of blood, eventually the tissue starts to die, and you get more and more dead tissue, and it basically gets this black appearance. It's dead. And at this point right here, it looks horrible, but it's not actually infected. However, it's at high risk for becoming infected, and generally speaking, when it becomes infected, that's when it converts to this wet gangrene over here. So let's first learn to identify what dry gangrene looks like. Dry gangrene has this characteristic mummified appearance in addition to being black. So if you ever watch any TV shows or movies that have mummies in them, okay, the, the mummified uh, corpses may not be black per se, but they do have this very dry, mummified appearance like this toe does right here. So mummified, that's a dead giveaway. Is there drainage with dry gangrene? No, this is dry gangrene. So we're not expecting fluid of any kind around this tissue, okay? And it's also going to be hard. If you were to palpate this, the tissue has lost its compliance because it's dead. So it will feel much harder than some of these other healthy-looking digits like numbers 1, 4, and 5, or the top of the foot, I'm presuming. Okay, so no drainage, and also no edema is expected with dry gangrene. There's also going to be no odor. Generally, you're only going to get an odor if there's an infection, but because dry gangrene has not become infected, it's just dead, there's not going to be any odor. Okay, and also there's going to be clear demarcation between the gangrenous black tissue and the other tissue adjacent to it, which you can kind of think about like the peri wound. So if we zoom in right here, uh, if you look at where this black tissue is, there's pretty clear demarcation between where the black is and where the black is not. Okay, when we look at wet gangrene, we'll actually see that it's more graded and there's not clear demarcation. Okay, so clear demarcation in conjunction with those other things, that indicates that you've got dry gangrene. Now what are the considerations for dry gangrene? Well, remember that this tissue is dead. Okay, completely dead. So what we're waiting for is what we call auto-amputation. So in auto-amputation, this part of the body will essentially just fall off. Okay? A regular amputation would be you go into the surgeon, they cut something off surgically. This will just naturally fall off, okay? like a leaf falls off of a tree in the autumn. Right? So we wait for that. And believe it or not, that's the more favorable outcome. The other outcome is it converts to wet gangrene. That's what we want to monitor for. And we'll talk about the characteristics of wet gangrene in a few minutes. But in the meantime, while we're monitoring to make sure it doesn't do that, and while we're waiting for auto amputation, we want to protect and we want to offload that part of the body. So in this case, we'd want to offload the second digit, probably the third also, okay? And so maybe that involves not weight bearing on that part of the body, okay? So maybe we want to have something where they're putting more weight on the heel and not on the balls of the feet, which is where the uh, toes are connected to. So protect and offload that part of the body. So weight bearing status, at least on this part of the foot, you're not going to be weight bearing on it. It's going to be offloaded. Do we use moist dressings or adhesives for gangrene? No. Okay, this is a dry tissue and generally moisture is what we want to heal, but we are assuming that this is dead and it is not going to heal. Okay, we want it to come off, right, to auto amputate. So we're not going to use moist dressings and we're not going to use adhesive dressings around this. 
Now, like I said, until we have knowledge otherwise, we assume that this second digit right here that's dry gangrene is unhealable. Now, it's always possible that with an MD opinion, they may say that this is actually healable. But unless that is the case, we just assume it is unhealable and follow these considerations. So what are some other interventions that we can do? Well, there's really nothing that we can do directly for this toe. Okay? We can't take it through range of motion. We can't strengthen muscles around it, right? There's nothing we can do on that second digit. However, we can moisturize the surrounding skin. Just make sure no moisture gets on that second digit where the gangrenous tissue is. If you look around here, that is extremely dry. Uh, we could certainly try to moisturize that. Uh, we also want to, as we said, monitor for infection. Okay? As of right now, this dry gangrene is not infected, even though it looks awful. Okay? If it gets infected, that's when we start seeing the drainage, the edema, the odor, the things more characteristic of wet gangrene, and that's where uh, we're in serious trouble. Uh, we can certainly do range of motions for joints and muscle flexibility around this, but we're not going to do it directly on this toe. So right there in the toe, of course, we'd have the DIP joint, the PIP joint. We're not going to do anything with those, and probably also not the MTP joint of the second digit. But we can certainly mobilize the ankle. We can mobilize the other digits. Because most likely, if the person has dry gangrene like this, they're probably not going to be using that foot a whole lot. We want to make sure that other muscles around the ankle joint, let's say, don't atrophy. And so we're going to make sure we do things with those joints, but not on the second digit. Exercise walking programs as appropriate and foot care guidelines as well, mainly adhering to this where we're protecting and offloading this component that is dead. Now, as we mentioned, this is the better prognosis. It's the lesser of two evils. But as we're treating a patient with dry gangrene and waiting for autoamputation, we have to monitor for signs and symptoms of infection. Now, I have a separate video where we go into the individual signs and symptoms of infection, but we're gonna talk about a few of them here as it relates to wet gangrene. So let's assume that our dry gangrene has progressed to wet gangrene, the worst prognosis. What's the appearance? Well, it's still gonna be very black in color, but now you're gonna have fluctuance and erythema. So if we zoom in here and look, you can see some redness actually right here on the bottom of the foot. That would be a little bit of erythema. Um, of course, this is that black tissue. There's a little bit on the third digit right there, okay? Is there going to be drainage? Yes. Is there going to be edema? Yes. Is there gonna be odor? Yes, because this wet gangrene is now infected. The biggest risk of infection really is osteomyelitis, where that infection spreads to the bone in that area. And so when that happens, pretty much uh, amputation by a surgeon is inevitable, and you'll probably end up losing more uh, than just this region uh, if you have to have that kind of surgery. Okay? There's also uh, no clear demarcation. We have graded borders between the dead tissue and the healthier tissue, I should say. So if we look here, a little bit difficult to tell, but up here is clearly this uh, wet gangrene, this dead tissue, and then down here is clearly healthier tissue. But if you look kind of in this area, it's kind of going from this blackish maroon to lightish black maroon, and then eventually it becomes healthy. So where exactly does the gangrene end? Where does it begin? Uh, that's a question. So there's not clear demarcation in wet gangrene, uh, which is the opposite of what we saw in dry gangrene. Okay. Now, if a patient does present with this wet gangrene, that's an immediate referral to the vascular surgeon because most likely if it's become infected, um, it either has or it probably will progress to osteomyelitis, which is going to uh, necessitate amputation. And if you don't do that, then it can cause things like sepsis if the infection spreads systemically. So very, very bad. Obviously, this is still going to be non-weight bearing. I mean, if the dry gangrene's non-weight bearing, the wet gangrene's also going to be non-weight bearing. You're not going to have to worry about moist dressings or adhesives because you're going to be sending them to the vascular surgeon immediately. Okay, I don't know why I have this in here as a duplicate. And so really, the only intervention that a physical therapist, occupational therapist, whomever would need to worry about would be the referral to the MD, the vascular surgeon. Okay, so the bottom line here is that dry gangrene, very dry, not infected. We just wait for autoamputation. Wet gangrene is infected, very bad. 
urgent referral to the vascular surgeon. So hopefully this video gave you a good overview of dry versus wet gangrene. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.